Hello and welcome to our series of teachings on the hope of the Christian, a very wonderful topic in the scriptures that teaches us how our high call is to become conformed to the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, the most wonderful calling in heaven or earth. And so we're going to be studying in these series of teachings about our high call, our hope as a Christian, and we will divide this study into two parts where we want to first gain by the spirit of revelation a vision of God's call upon us, what is the hope of the Christian, and then in our second section we will be studying different aspects of wisdom through which we can begin to enter in to the hope of the Christian, enter into developing the nature and likeness of Christ within our lives. So join me in this exciting study of the scriptures that can help us all to become more like our Lord Jesus himself. And so we want to start studying, as I said, the first part of our notes about what is the hope of the Christian. And to see this, we need a vision of our Christian goal. We need the spirit of revelation to begin to open our spiritual understanding to what is the high call of God available for every Christian. And so if you have the notes or want to download a copy of the notes, we want to look at in part one about uh, vision of our Christian goal, why we need a vision of our Christian goal. And when we use the word vision, we don't necessarily mean you have your eyes closed and you see a movie of something before you. No, a vision can very simply just be understood as something that is clearly understood in our hearts and in our minds. And so if we clearly see something, we can picture it in our mind, in our heart, we understand this, then that's what we're talking about as a vision of the high call of God for every Christian. What is our hope as Christians that we are to enter into in the purposes of God? And so we need a vision of our Christian goal so that when we see the end of the race, when we see the mark or goal that we are to aim for, then that gives us perspective. It gives us motivation. It causes us to focus in that we can run our race or fight our good fight. And so the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3 verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. But for him to press to the goal means he saw his goal. He understood his calling. He understood what God was offering for his Christian life. And that motivated him to press towards the goal, just like uh, someone in a, in a sports event will press toward the goal, will press toward the finish line, because they see what is ahead and what is the glorious end that they can achieve. So we aim our life like shooting an arrow, the scriptures can teach us. When we look at Romans chapter 3, verse 23, where in most translations it will simply say something like, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But when we look into the original Bible Greek of that verse, what it actually says is, For all have sinned, that's Hamartia, and that means to fall short like an arrow that was aimed at a target, but it fell short. To fall short is the description of that word that we in English call sin. And yet, we are to be those that see our goal 
and aim our life so completely at it that we don't lose energy, we don't uh, fail the race, we don't lack strength, but we're pressing on to hit the mark of the high call of God. And what is the call that we are to enter into? The glory of God itself. That we are to have the nature, the glorious nature of Jesus Christ transforming our lives and shining out of our lives for the eternal ages to come. And so we don't want to fall short. We don't want to sin, but we want to see there is a goal. There is a purpose for each of our lives, for every Christian to enter into. And when we see that goal, when we're pressing in towards it, then we can aim ourselves, we can pace ourselves, we can run our race with perseverance until the end and cross the finish line as a victor. And so at the end of his life, in his last writing, in the last chapter of his book, 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul said at the end of his life is a triumphant a testimony of of what he had achieved by the grace of God. He said in verses 7 and 8, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. And so, do you love Christ's appearing? Then it's not just for the Apostle Paul, it's for all who love his appearing, all who want to embrace the Lord Jesus, who will not be ashamed on that day, but have finished their race, have, will be ready to hear the wonderful words of our Lord Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. When we've fought the good fight and finished the race, then there will be a reward, there will be triumph, there will be glory for every Christian at the end of the race of our life. But we have to understand what is the hope of our calling. What is the highest call of God for our lives? Because God has many purposes for our lives and we don't have time and we won't study a lot of the lesser purposes Ephesians 4.11 tells us the purposes of being called to various ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Wonderful, but that's not the high call. Our high call is not just that we're saved from hell and headed for heaven. That's wonderful, but that's only part of God's plans. Our high call is not even just that in the kingdom age to come that we those of us who will qualify will rule and reign with Christ. A glorious future, but there's something higher and more eternal. That is to become conformed to the image of Christ for all eternity. And we want to lift our vision to see the high call of God in these lessons that we're going to be studying now. How we can focus on God's highest and best for our life, which will include many steps up. It will include many steps of callings that will help us uh, grace by grace, strength by strength, glory upon glory. It will help us to press on higher towards God's full plan. But we need to uh, see how God has equipped us, how God is preparing us so that we will, uh, will be ready to accomplish God's purposes and not our own plans. Because we can make many human plans that may sound good and can have a measure of benefit to them, but are not God's best. And he has designed us to achieve the best. So we need to find out what has he designed us for? What is the best that we are to aim for? And it's just a natural illustration. When I was young in secondary school, 
I loved the game of football. In my home country of America, they call it soccer. And I loved the game. I went out for the soccer team and I was accepted. But the problem was I could run with endurance and, and, and be all over the, the field, but my foot skills were very poor. And so uh, every time I tried to hit the ball well, I just wasn't one of the best players. And as a result, whenever our team played other teams, I was always sitting on the bench as a cheerleader, encouraging my teammates that were better than me for them to, you know, win the games. But some of my teammates had pity on me, seeing me game after game, not being there uh, participating. I was needed for the B team, the secondary team, because in training, the team that would play on the games had to have another team to compete with for training. So I was the B team that just helped the A team. I never got out on the real games. But at the end of the school uh, year of the football, some of my classmates in the team said, Norman, uh, you're not good at foot skills. You're probably never going to become a good uh, football player, but you have endurance. You should change sports next year. You are not equipped to be a good football player, but you can run with endurance. You should go out for long distance running and you will probably be quite successful. And I considered what they said and I thought, that's true. I'd never run long distance races. I didn't even know if I liked it. I loved football, but I didn't want to sit on the bench the whole time as a cheerleader. I wanted to achieve. I wanted to, uh, uh, to accomplish something of, uh, uh, for, the, for the team and, and for my own satisfaction. So the next year I went out for long distance running and I did quite well. Out of maybe 60 runners, I could be sometimes third place. I never won, but I was always up at the front of the pack. I was always doing very well, and it was very satisfying to use the, uh, the body and the equipping God had created me with to achieve a higher level of success, not as a football player, but as a long-distance racer. But then after the end of that sports year, I had some friends that offered me even better wisdom. And they said, Norman, you're good at long distance running and you're good at skiing. There is a sport that combines both. It's cross country skiing, where you're running across the landscape, sometimes hills, valleys, flat. You're running with the skis and it's like running, but it also takes skiing skill. They said, why don't you go out for that next year? And I considered and thought, yeah, they're right. And so when I went out for the new sport that I never considered myself, it was able to combine the God-given equipping God had given me in my natural talents so that I became champion in my area of New York State. I went to all of the big sporting events and, and got in, into the hotels and nice meals. And it was exciting, it was fun, it was great to achieve. It's much better to be a champion than to sit on the bench as a cheerleader for the people that were succeeding. And God doesn't want any of us, spiritually speaking, to just sit on the bench and see other Christians going on to achieve more and more in their lives, to go on with God and, and, and get breakthroughs. And, and while we stay the same and accomplish nothing, go nowhere, God doesn't want that for any of our lives. God has created each of us with our own unique talents and abilities and with the equipping so that we can aim for the high call of God in Christ Jesus. If we focus on the right goal, if we're running the right race, every Christian can become a champion. Do you want to be a champion or a bench warmer that doesn't even get to participate?
It depends on whether we see what we can best do, what God has equipped us to aim for and achieve. And so, like a racer that's running the best race or the fighter that's equipped to fight the best fight, we want to have a vision of what God has ahead for us. And so Proverbs 29 verse 18 tells us further, where there is no vision, the people perish. Or another translation, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. The people are undisciplined without a vision, without a goal. A goal will motivate us, give us direction. Athletes are motivated to train and win their contest because there is a prize ahead of them. Paul wrote of that in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 and 25, when he said, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it for a perishable crown. But we, we Christians, we for an imperishable, eternal crown. Athletes go for an award. If you're in the Olympics, you'll, get, you'll aim for the gold. But actually, it's a gold-plated medal that's not worth all that much. But people are interested in the natural achievement, in the glory of, of even getting a gold medal in the Olympics. A whole nation will cheer when someone achieves that. And we want to have that motivation behind us that we are going for much more than a gold-plated medal. Or as the ancient Olympics they had a crown, a wreath of olive leaves that in a few months or few years would turn into dust. It's a perishable reward. We as Christians are preparing for, we are, we are uh, stretching toward the mark of a high call that is eternal to become like Jesus himself. And so we want that vision so that we're motivated to do our best. A person that wants to be a winner in an athletic competition could have friends say, hey, we're going to have a, a great party. Uh, come to the party and uh, we'll stay up all night. And yet even a worldly athlete would say, I can't stay up all night. I've got to get my sleep. I, I, I can't go to a wild party. I've, I've got my discipline. I've got my, my practice to do. How much more for us Christians, we have our spiritual exercises, our prayer and praise, our studying the word of God, those things that will build us up to not be naturally strong, but spiritually strong, that we can run our spiritual race with perseverance. And we won't at the end be like the arrow that falls short of the goal. And hamartia, sins, fall short. No, but that we will hit the mark of the high call of God for our lives. So we want that vision of God's purposes to motivate us on. There was a survey at one of the modern Olympics where a newspaper reporter asked a number of Olympic contestants a question and said, if you could take a drug that was not illegal, would not be detected, was not illegal, but if you could take a drug that could guarantee you a gold medal in your competition at the World Olympics, but a bad side effect of that drug is you would be dead within five years, would you want to take that drug? Not illegal, fine to take, except for the side effect, dead in five years. 
every athlete that was given that challenge said, yes, I would take that drug. Yes, a gold medal is better than living a long life. Well, for a Christian, we have such higher goals. And we, as we see those higher goals, can gain a greater consecration than even the Olympians, even the, 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 the best of the best athletes that have worked so hard to achieve. Huh. Our rewards, our goal is so much higher. And it's not just for a few years of fame. It's for millions of years without end that we are pressing on for that high call of God in Christ. Now, another imagery used in the Bible is that of soldiers that become disciplined and prepare to win their battle. And so in 2 Timothy 2, verse 3, the Apostle Paul exhorted young Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Soldiers will endure great hardness to become the victors. Some armies have been, had been known to march all night and fight all the next day and stay awake even for 30, 40, 50 hours and, and focus in and, and have the focus and the strength because they had become disciplined. They had a goal, the best of the best. And those that prepare the best will become the best. Now, in Psalm 110, verse 3, we can read in the New King James of the English Bible, your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. Another translation, the NIV says that the people will all volunteer on your day, on your day of battle. And it is true in the natural that when perhaps a nation is invaded and everyone in the nation is angry at the, at the oppressor, at the aggressor, and, uh, and the nation needs help, it needs volunteers, when a war starts, oh, multitudes of patriotic young men will join the armed forces. We must rise, we must drive out the invaders. And multitudes join when the day of battle starts. That was what that scripture said. Your people will all volunteer in the day of your power, on your day of battle. But what is an important question for us to understand is, who will volunteer before the day of battle? Who will volunteer and prepare in advance, for example, before revival comes. When revival comes and the power of God is around us, everybody wants to jump in and be part of the glorious action. But who are going to be the people that prepare beforehand? Maybe when the churches are dry. Maybe when it's hard to persevere in prayer. Who is going to have a vision that we have to prepare for the day of battle? We have to prepare for the day of revival. Because in natural armies, it's those that enlist early and prepare the best that on the day when war starts and multitudes join the army, the, all the new recruits start at the lowest level. They start as privates. But the people that had already been privates, that already understood what it is to you know, be disciplined and follow the rules, then they're going to be promoted. They're going to go up, be sergeants, be promoted, maybe even to captains. The ones that prepared the best beforehand, that had a vision before to press on and get prepared, they are the ones that will find themselves catapulted up on the day of battle, on the day of revival, that will be multiplied into a greater reward and inheritance. Our Lord Jesus said, 
In Matthew 25, twice he said to his servants that had taken a few talents and multiplied them, uh, okay, you've, you've, you've taken two talents and multiplied it. I will give you much. The one who gains more, and in the other parable, the one who gains ten talents will be given ten cities, five cities to the one that gained five talents, ten cities to the one that gained talents. Great multiplied reward in the coming purposes of God for those who have developed their character, who have developed their abilities, for those that have become the most like Christ in this life, they will be given the higher positions of ruling and reigning with Christ in his coming kingdom because they prepared more. They're more qualified. They are ready for higher promotions. So we want to be those that have a vision of preparing now, of preparing wholeheartedly for the greater plans of God. For revival in this lifetime, yes. For multiplication of the work of God in this life, amen. But with a multiplication of God's wisdom and grace and power within our life, not just for what will be accomplished in this lifetime, but for the ages to come, that we will be those that will be promoted and will rule and reign with Christ in his coming eternal kingdom. And so we need a vision of our Christian goal to motivate us, to get us focused in, that we're aiming our arrow with strength to hit the mark, that we're running our race with perseverance to win, that we're fighting the good fight and we'll be ready for our, the eternal crowns and rewards that God has ahead for his people. And so that's why we need a vision of our Christian goal, the hope of the Christian. But we want to go on in our study now and look in the next section of our notes, if you have a copy. And number B, we need the spirit of revelation for us to see the hope of our calling, for us to see the spiritual purposes of God in this life and in the ages to come, we need God's Holy Spirit to give us revelation. And specifically, we need the anointing of the Spirit of revelation. There are many anointings of the Holy Spirit spoken of in Scripture. In the book of Revelation, chapters 4 and 5, we read about the seven spirits of God that are listed for us in Isaiah chapter 11. The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of knowledge of the fear of the Lord, a spirit of might, seven anointings there. But many other scriptures spoken of in Scripture, the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of might, the spirit of judgment and of burning, many different anointings the Holy Spirit can give us to help equip us and cause us to be able to press on to the mark of God's highest for our lives. And the one anointing that we want to look at that's crucial for what we're studying now is the spirit of revelation. And so we can read in Ephesians chapter 1, the prayer of the Apostle Paul for a church he helped found, the Ephesian church. And this was a Pentecostal church. They spoke in tongues. They prophesied. They knew the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But Paul said they needed more anointings. And so he, starting in verse 15, he said, After I heard of your faith in the Lord and your love for the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, being opened, that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What is the hope of the Christian? 
We will only see it by the spirit of revelation for God to open our spiritual eyes and give us a vision, a clear understanding in our minds and hearts of God's purposes that each Christian can enter into. So we need that, this spirit of revelation. Paul also wrote in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But then verse 10 goes on and says, But God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. God wants to reveal to us by his Spirit The unknown things that the natural eye cannot see, our natural ears cannot hear, that we can't even dream about because God's plans are so much greater and higher. Now consider that each of us begins our life in our mother's womb. And when an unborn child is growing in his mother's womb, He is starting to develop physically. He's starting to develop spiritually. We read about John the Baptist when he was in his mother's womb and he met Jesus in the mother's womb of uh, Mary that John leapt for joy. His calling in life, his ministry was to prepare the way for Jesus. And when he first met Jesus, they were not yet born. There was the witness of the Spirit. Oh, this is what I am created for. And by the Spirit, he was filled and jumped for joy. Even not only our bodies develop in our mother's womb, but our spirit develops there. And there have been many studies in recent years on how our mind and our emotions starts to develop even before we are born. Children that repeatedly hear a certain song before they're born will recognize it after they're born. People will recognize the voice of their mother and father after they're born because they heard it for the months when their ears were able to hear in the womb. But consider how limited the knowledge is of an unborn child. If someone tried to tell that unborn child, oh, you have a far greater life ahead of you. You're in darkness now. You've never even seen anything except maybe a little glimmer of light through your mother's skin, maybe a bright light. But no, you've been in darkness all your life. You're going to enter into a brighter light than you've ever seen. You're going to see a whole world around you. In the womb, our world was very small. If someone tried to tell a baby in the womb, you're going to have a huge world all around you. You'll see, you'll feel, you'll explore, you'll walk. The baby in the womb would not know what is being explained to him. The life that is to come for an unborn child is far greater then he has the ability to understand. And with us in this life, our ability to understand the life that is to come after our death and resurrection in the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus, what is the world to come going to be like? Unless God reveals it by his spirit, unless we study the scriptures, we're going to say, oh, that's ridiculous. There's no life after death. It's just nothing. There's just, uh, what are you talking about? Eternity and glory and, and eye has not seen, ear has not heard. Unless God reveals to us by his spirit, then we remain ignorant like the unborn child understand so little. But Paul prayed for the Ephesian church they would be given the spirit of revelation. Have you ever prayed for God to give you the anointing of the spirit of revelation? 
Paul prayed for this spirit-filled Pentecostal church that had a prophecy, had the power of God, but he knew they needed more if they were going to go on to the mark of the high call of God and fulfill the hope of the Christian, Christ in you, the hope of eternal glory. Hallelujah. And so Paul prayed the Ephesians would receive more, and we need to pray that we will receive more. Now in Proverbs 25, verse 2, we read, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. Now, this can seem confusing. It is to the natural mind. God is glorified when he hides. Kings are glorified when they find what is hidden. They are opposites. Why? Why is God glorified when he conceals or hides something? But to the opposite, kings are glorified when they reveal what is hidden. Well, what God wants to teach us is that God often hides his glory. He hides his uh, future plans. He does not show the greatness of his future plans for people who will not appreciate them and could even despise them. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, do not give what is holy to the dogs. He's not talking about natural dogs. He's talking about unclean people that will reject what is holy and, and think it's, it's useless or bad. And he said, don't cast your pearls to the pigs. Now, pearls in the scriptures speak about wonderful things, the entrance ways into the eternal city of God, the new Jerusalem. Each entranceway is a huge pearl. And pearls speak of entering into the purposes of God. And when Jesus said, don't cast your pearls to the pigs, he was saying anybody that's unclean and, and low-minded like a pig, uh, don't offer them pearls, don't offer them the riches of God's kingdom because they won't evaluate them. They won't appreciate them. They won't know what's going on. When you tell a pig, uh, here, piggy, piggy, here, do you want some pearls to eat? Well, that pig, uh, he, he might come up and hope for a nice rotten piece of food, but if he bites into a pearl, he's going to spit it out like it's a useless rock, and he's going to come to attack you looking for something good to eat instead. Don't cast your pearls to the pigs. Don't give that which is precious in God's kingdom to people who will not understand or appreciate or use them correctly. There is an old ancient English hymn that says, Though the eyes of sinful man your glory cannot see. The reason is God hides his glory from those that are not prepared from those that will not understand it, from those that will even reject it. I remember once I saw the glory of God revealed at a funeral. And when the glory of God was revealed, we were, I was helping lead a choir that was singing about the glory of heaven. And there was actually a visible manifestation of God's glory. And when that came, many people there, there were hundreds of unbelievers that came to the funeral of this a pillar in their community, this very well-respected man in their town. And, and out of all of these hundreds of people, dozens started weeping when the glory of God showed them, that man is in heaven. He's in the glory of God. And, and, and they wept their way to be touched and impacted by God. But there were also many people, unbelievers, that when the glory of God came, they jumped out of their seats they plugged their ears and they ran screaming, ah, 
out from the funeral. They could not tolerate the glory of God. They did not want it. To them, in their sinful nature, it was torment. God gives his glory to those who are ready. And so, it is the glory of God to hide his treasures, his purposes, his great plans. But, if we want to be kings and queens in God's kingdom, we need to learn how to search out the hidden glorious purposes of God. And if by the spirit of revelation we can see past our natural vision, we can see into the plans of God, we are hungry and thirsty for more of God, we want what God has. We're preparing ourselves. We're going to embrace it and use it and run a good race and fight a good fight and press on towards that glory that we see. Then we are becoming kings and queens because when you search out God's hidden things, the treasures become yours. They are built within you. The kingdom of God, our Lord Jesus said in Matthew 13, is like a merchant man seeking for very good pearls. And when he finds one pearl more precious than all the rest, he's ready to sell out everything he has to buy that one most precious treasure. And God wants us to find treasures in his kingdom, by the spirit of revelation, to see his purposes, his high call, what he wants to accomplish. And through that, we will sell out our lives to press on to the mark of the high call of God for our lives. And so we want revelation, however it may come. It can come in so many different ways. I'll just give you two very different examples. When I was in Bible school, my first year at Bible school, I was praying at a prayer meeting, and at the end, everybody left the sanctuary. I stayed there a little longer. A friend of mine went to the back door of the sanctuary, but then he turned around and looked at me up at the front altar, and for some reason, I turned around and looked at him. We made eye contact, and my friend just came back and said, Brother Norman, I just feel I should pray for you. Is that okay? And I said, fine, pray for me. I need all the prayer I can get. And so I closed my eyes and he laid hands on me. He's praying for me. He was speaking in unknown tongues when by the gift of the interpretation of tongues, another of the gifts of the Holy Spirit of 1 Corinthians 12, I understood what the Holy Spirit was praying in an unknown language for him, but I was gaining a spiritual interpretation. He gave me a list of the nations in Asia that I would travel through. And then I saw a map and I saw myself as an arrow going through these nations and accomplishing the works of God as a missionary. And then I, he was listing a number of nations in, in Central America and I saw a second vision and the countries I'd go to, and, and the, the revival fires that would spring up there. And after I had that vision, and I, I heard all of these nations that I would go to as a missionary, then the revelation was done, the Spirit of God lifted, and my friend said to me, Brother Norman, do you ever feel you have been called to be a missionary? So he had a little bit of the interpretation because that's what God was revealing to me in such scope. Now, visions, maps, a nation's names one after another. And so God very graciously at Bible school, along with many other confirmations and guidances, he gave me a vision. He revealed by the spirit of revelation what was ahead for me in this earthly life that would help also prepare me 
for my eternal calling and rewards. And so there are times God can give us an actual vision. Our eyes are closed and God gives us a vision of our future. But there are other times God can give revelation in much different ways. So let me tell you a somewhat humorous illustration of another brother that graduated from the same Bible school as me, although many years before. Years before I was a student, there was another young man that prayed every night in his dormitory room. Lord, show me my calling. Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, show me my calling. And he prayed loud every night. And the walls in our dormitory weren't very soundproof. And so there was a young man that lived in the next room that heard him every night. Oh, Lord, what is my calling? And heard through the wall and his sleep was disturbed. And he just heard the same thing over and over again. Show me my calling. And, and it, was, it was very irritating for that other man. And so... After this went on for many, many evenings, and he was really provoked, listening to this man in the next room, through the wall, Lord, what is my calling? This other man put his hands up to the wall, and in a low, strong voice said, Go to Africa! He said that, spoke it into the wall. And so the man praying in the next room heard this deep voice from nowhere say, go to Africa. And he took it as the voice of God. So the next morning he went to breakfast and told everybody, I've heard from God. I'm going to be a missionary in Africa. I know my calling now. And the young man who spoke that to him is a, is a joke was embarrassed to tell him, no, that wasn't God, that was me. He never told him. That young man prepared for the mission field, went to Africa, and he raised up a team of ministers that saw revival, and he and his team started over 6,000 churches in Africa. So when that young man was irritated to say, go to Africa, thank God he didn't say, go to Antarctica or go to the moon. No. Remember the story of Balaam? God spoke through a donkey and gave guidance and revelation. Well, God gave a true revelation to the man that was praying through an irritated fellow student that was irritated and just playing a joke on him. But it was a prophecy from God. So whether, uh, however God chooses to speak to us, uh, we want to have our eyes and ears open and we need to be praying for the spirit of revelation so that God can speak to us and open this, our spiritual eyes to show us what is the hope of his calling. So let us pray right now together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We have been listening to your words. We thank you for the guidance of your scriptures that teach us how we are to focus our life in for that which is eternal, for that which is your highest and best. And Lord, we pray that you will help each of us to understand more about our hope as Christians, that Christ in us, the hope of glory, is a future calling, that we are to become conformed to the image of Christ, that we are to become more and more like Jesus from strength to strength and from glory to glory, that we are to prepare for your great high eternal purposes that are ahead. So Lord, give us that spirit of revelation. We pray, Lord, for everyone listening and praying this prayer that you will give us more of the spirit of revelation. Open our spiritual understanding. 
Cause us to know, Lord God, what are your purposes for our lives, Lord, so that we will see what is the goal that we are to press toward, Lord, so that we will see what is the fight we are to finish, Lord, that we will run our race with perseverance until we cross the finish line. Even so, Lord God, give us that spirit of revelation, Lord, and help that to become a a consistent prayer in our lives that you will be able to lead us on into your higher and higher purposes by the spirit of revelation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.